Welcome to the Terrible Podcast with your host from SteelersDepot.com, where you can find all your latest and greatest Steelers news. It's Dave Bryan and Alex Kazora, always lit, talking Steelers. And now, here's Dave and Alex. Welcome to the Terrible Podcast, Season 14, Episode 91. He's Josh Carney. I'm Alex Kazora, SteelersDepot.com. Thanks for being back with us here this Friday, Steelers Nation. Dave Bryan on a bit of vacation right now. I think he'll be visiting uh, Joe Clark up uh, northeast in a couple of days, and he's out back in his stomping grounds of Florida right now. So i uh, going to have some guests on, I think, for the next couple of episodes until Dave gets back in a couple of episodes from now. So as you guys heard, Filling in today is our Josh Carney, who isn't too far removed from his time uh, in Frisco, Texas for the Shrine Bowl, wasn't able to come on the Shrine Bowl show. And so I figured I'd invite Josh on now, get his thoughts on what happened in Frisco, get his thoughts on what's happening in Pittsburgh right now. So thanks for being on, Josh. Yeah, thanks, Alex, for having me. I really appreciate you guys bringing me on again. And uh, yeah, I hope I hope Dave is getting uh, much needed relaxation here on, on this trip. <laughs> I hope so as well. Um, all right, let, let's. There's really no major, to, to my recollection, at least in terms of major Steelers news occurring. So let, let's just kind of jump right into the Shrine Bowl um, and what you observed down there. It was the yeah. first time it was in Frisco, Texas. And how many years had you been there by now? It's been uh, first time in Texas, I know, but but several right. times to the Shrine Bowl. Uh, this was my third trip to Shrine Bowl. So I did the first two years in Vegas, and then obviously this year uh, in Frisco. So uh, yeah, it's it's gotten better and better uh each year i know that i had some some reservations about them moving to the dallas cowboys practice facility uh this year just because i thought vegas was so smooth the last two years but uh fantastic time uh it was myself joe clark uh tony calderon and and, uh dr mel were down there and uh an awesome team there for steelers depot we had a blast and uh yeah i i thought the the east west shrine bowl crew um the actual east west shrine bowl did a great job putting that event on and the Dallas Cowboys practice facility is spectacular. I mean, it might rival some actual stadiums in the NFL, how, how beautiful <laughs> that place is. So it was a blast. And we saw a lot of very good prospects that I'm sure we'll talk about here. Was there any difference in terms of the format or layout or even how the coaches ran the practices? I mean, how do they determine the Shrine Bowl coaching staff? Is that per team, like the old school way? Or is that pieced together the way the Shrine Bowl or the Senior Bowl, excuse me, has done the last two two years? It's it's pieced together. So the last okay. few years, it had been specific teams. I know last year in Vegas, it was ironically the uh, Falcons with Arthur Smith and the Patriots uh, with with Troy Brown was leading the group, but Bill Belichick was there. But this year, a lot of it was just really pieced together, um, giving some lesser known guys some opportunities. I know Mike Kafka uh, was the coach for one team, and then um, Chicago Bears Richard Hightower was the head coach for the other team. But there were a lot of uh, different position coaches there, uh, you know, assistant position coaches that were really getting a shot to run position groups and, and have more exposure. I know Gerald Alexander, uh, former assistant safeties coach for the Steelers, was there. He's now reportedly moved on to Vegas. He's still on the team website for the Steelers uh, at, at last glance, but he ran a position group. Uh, and there were a lot of guys that were experienced coaches but needed more exposure uh, that, that certainly got that opportunity. And Alexander, he was in Raiders uh, uniform whenever he was down there, right? That was after the announcement. No, I so no, he he didn't have any mm. any team colors on. A mm. lot of it was just standard, you know, gray Nike or Under Armour that day. And then he had some East West Shrine Bull gear on, but no Raiders, no Steelers, uh, nothing like that. So it was very curious mm-hmm. um, that that report was out there. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. I don't see him on the Raiders website, just kind of their main public page. So. We'll keep an eye on it. Um, it was reported to, to have happened, so uh, we'll, we'll keep you updated there. In terms of the the layout and the format of the week, was it any different than past Shrine Bowls at this new location? No, not really. Um, you know, obviously from the media standpoint, uh, we had our we had our sessions uh, in the, the Hyatt Regency. It was right outside where the players were meeting with the teams. Um, so it was just kind of that car wash. You go through the speed dating with the players and the teams, and then you get like an hour with certain position groups. Uh, there was less space uh, in the media section. There were a lot more, um, 
you know, video and audio podcasts that were there that that kind of pushed the <laughs> the print media guys to the side. Uh, but as far as the practices go, no, it was it was pretty much the same thing. Um, you know, we had free run of the place. We could sit in the stands to get a better view. We could be right there on the sideline. Uh, just a great time again. And and Eric Galco and his staff with the Shrine Bowl just just do a fantastic job. And they've taken it to new heights here in the last few years. Absolutely. It's really grown, I think, by leaps and bounds. So excited to hear about that. I'd actually just check here. Gerald Alexander, his Twitter page and his LinkedIn account both reflect working for the Raiders. So mm. I assume that's what's happening, despite some of the weirdness about that being announced publicly by apparently both teams. All right, Josh, let's um, I'm just going to kind of give you some really broad questions. And I usually hate to do that, but I think you can you can take the baton here. Um, who, who stuck out and, and did you have anyone you were going into Texas wanting to watch in particular? If so, what was yep. your evaluation of them and why did you want to watch them as you, you know, approach the, the week? I was very excited when I saw that Texas A&M's Edger and Cooper uh, inside linebacker was going to be at the East West Shrine Bowl. And then uh, we get there and he was not participating in the week, just doing team interviews, uh, which I mean is smart. He's a, a top 50 prospect. There is some buzz that he could go in the back end of the first round. Uh, but really, I was going in, I was looking at the linebackers just because I feel that that's a, you know, an area of need for the Steelers. It feels like it has been every year at this point. Uh, one name that that really caught my eye, Alex, over the week was Dallas Gant, uh, a linebacker from Toledo. Uh, we know how the Steelers love their their Mac guys, but this guy also went to Ohio State for a few years. Uh, I, I thought he was one of the best athletes on the field, regardless of position throughout the week. He just made plays in the passing game. He was all over the place in the run game. I think he checked in just under 6'3", 225 pounds. Uh, I'm having a tough time tracking down Toledo defensive tape. Uh, mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, he he really caught my eye throughout the week. And then a guy that I just actually did a profile on, I believe it went up Thursday morning, uh, Florida State's Renardo Green, a cornerback. The guy played press man coverage 78% of the time in college last year uh, at, at Florida State, and he, he thrived on an island. Uh, a little undersized, 5'11", 31 inch arms, uh, but man, he's got a bulldog mentality, and he just locked guys up throughout the season. So uh, those two caught my eye down there. Offensive line play was a little disappointing, especially for the East team. Uh, they just were they were overmatched throughout the week, and then uh, again, you know, for the for the third year in a row, you come out of the East West Shrine Bowl feeling a little underwhelmed with the quarterback play. But the two years before that, you had Brock Purdy. And then you had Tommy DeVito. So it's like one of those guys that was at the, the East West Shrine Bowl this year, uh, quarterback wise, could be that that rookie sensation here. Uh, but yeah, just a, a great week. A lot of guys that that really made some plays. Uh, and I think, again, you know, they had Zay Flowers last year. This year, I don't think Virginia's Malik Washington is going in the first round, but he was very clearly the best player down there uh, right mm-hmm. from the start. Uh, just a fantastic receiver. You look at his tape, he looks a lot like Tyreek Hill, kind of that smaller, thick build, uh, makes a lot of guys miss and has great speed. So I did a profile on him for the site as well. But uh, yeah, there were a lot of Steelers uh, front office members down there as well. Uh, I don't have that pulled up in front of me, but I believe it was close to 10 personnel overall. Um, so that's up from from previous years. Probably helps that the locations were closer this year. Yeah. You know, yeah. being in Texas and in Mobile, not not as far of a trip there with how stacked these these events are basically in almost back to week, back to back weeks with some overlap there. Um on 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 the quarterbacks, I know you said they were underwhelming and that was kind of the the feeling from everyone we talked to previously, but was there if you had to pick one name that stuck out or just even beyond the Shrine Bowl week, just kind of what you know about them and, and their tape potentially any any late day three guys? Because I think if Pittsburgh does draft a quarterback, which those odds I think are very real, but it's going to be a, a day three type as opposed to a, a, a top two round type of guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd probably lean more towards Talia Tagovailoa. Uh, I thought throughout the week he just got better and better uh, early on. You know, obviously in these these all star type formats, they're throwing to receivers they're not used to. They're in a system they're not used to. The first few days can be a bit rough. Uh, but I thought he settled down late in the week. I thought he looked good in the game itself. Uh, and obviously we know the bloodlines there. He's two as younger brother. So uh, I, I thought he impressed me. And, you know, I did like Jack Plummer out of Louisville throughout the week. He's more of that ex- experienced pocket passer type guy, decent arm. He just read things well throughout the week. But then obviously in the game, uh, he really underperformed. But 
I think Talia Tagovailoa is that guy that I'm I'm kind of watching there on day three. Uh, that could be that that guy that that gets an opportunity in the season and maybe runs with it. Can you talk about Renardo Green a bit more? You mentioned the profile. I know you said his you know yeah. man heavy usage with the Seminoles, but just more background on him and and do you see him as a true fit in Pittsburgh? Yeah, I do. I and mean, honestly, um, going into the week, I started to do you know some background on him, and I saw the man heavy scheme. I saw you know Pro Football Focus had him highly rated in man coverage. Um, I, I do think he's a fit. He did show some work in the slot as well. There were some reps against the run where I just thought he was out of position and didn't really want to stick his face in there. But then there were also some reps. Uh, I have one in the profile where he just he flies downhill and, and, and lays the smack down to a, a Clemson running back. Uh, I really like his just his physical mentality, his ability to mirror in coverage. Uh, it felt like at times he was running routes for receivers, which when you see that from a young corner, it's really impressive. My only real knock on him was his inability to finish in coverage. He had, you know, 22 passes defensed in his career. He had 13 last year, but just one interception. And I, that kind of sounds to me like Joey Porter Jr., quite honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, but but on tape, Green had a couple of dropped interceptions. So I do I do worry a little bit about the hands. But just from a play style and his ability to, to thrive on an island, be aggressive in, in press coverage and kind of shut down some top talent. Uh, it really stood out to me. If you want to get a good feel for him, watch the LSU game uh, to open the year last year. He shut down Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas, two guys that are getting top of the first round buzz right now. And, uh, you know, I think with Green, he's going to go to the combine. I think he's going to test relatively well. And I think as more and more people get to him, uh, they're going to realize, hey, this guy could probably step in quickly in the NFL and, and handle a starting role. He's more of an outside guy. I know you said he played in the slot a bit, but is yeah. he next level in the outside corner? Yeah, I, I think so. He, he definitely has that versatility to move inside. Uh, but he a, a lot of his snaps were outside aligned, and, and he was you know put up at the line of scrimmage. Hey, press this man. You got this guy shut down this side of the field. And that allowed Florida State to, to do quite a bit around him uh, from a coverage standpoint. But I, I definitely think he's able to, to float – you know, inside and outside, but I think he's at his best when he's outside in that man coverage. Uh, he does have some issues in zone. He mm -hmm. kind of floats around in zone, uh, kind of gets lost at times. I think he's much better when he's in phase with a receiver and has a guy rather than a, an area. Gotcha. And then in terms of round, it's a pretty strong and deep cornerback class. Where do you think roughly he's projected to go? Yeah, I think he's going to go in the third round. Uh, I, I, I had a late day two grade, so that's, you know, third round. Roughly, I, I could see him falling to the fourth round just because of the size. You know, like I said, 5'11", 31 inch arms that might, you know, worry some teams, especially with the lack of, of ball production. But I have him in the third round. Uh, wouldn't shock me if he goes in the second because of his success in, in press man. Uh, but this guy, yeah, I think third round, certainly top 75 at this point. Uh, I, I really think you're going to start to hear his name more and more as we get closer to the draft. Looking more broadly at the you know secondary group overall, you know I, I focused a lot on the outside corner and maybe too much because there's slot corner concerns. I mean, even if you assume Patrick Peterson will be kept in terms of you know potential rundown guys, and of course the future if Peterson does return, I think 2024 is likely it for him in the NFL and in Pittsburgh. Safety is questionable. Besides Minka, it's strong safety. What are you going to do there? Will you keep Casey and Neil? One of those guys, I think Neil more likely than Casey can get cut and. They just need some youth and some speed. I think of that safety group overall. So what other, you know, DBs from that week stood out to you even beyond guys who just play outside corner? You know, honestly, MJ Devonshire stood out quite a bit. The pit kid grew up, mm -hmm. went to Aliquippa. Um, he's, he is strictly an outside corner though. He, he doesn't have the, the size or the physicality to play inside. Uh, but really again, a guy, you know, man coverage, put him on an Island. Uh, Pitt has done that. The last few years under Pat Narduzzi, and they've produced some cornerbacks at the NFL level that have, have played well right away. Uh, I thought he had a really good week. Jarius Monroe from Tulane really surprised me. He came into the week listed as a cornerback, and he spent the entire week uh, at, at safety kind of playing that, that center field role in the single high. Uh, I believe he was, if I'm recalling correctly, the defensive MVP of the game because he had an interception. Mm. I think he can handle the slot. Uh, he, you know, he played outside at Tulane, but 
just his ability to read plays, his physicality coming downhill, uh, his communication stood out big time. That's a guy that I have circled, uh, you know, kind of a day three target. I believe he was a team captain at Tulane. I'm sure we'll have a profile on him uh, at some point. But those were the two that really, you know, stood out to me uh, as guys that could be fits in Pittsburgh, but also just had a really good week overall. Were you the one to talk to Devonshire? Did you speak with yes, him? Yes, okay. yes, yes. Do you know? Yeah, the- I talked to. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Well, I was I was going to ask. Do you know the backstory why he went to Kentucky first, and then what led him back to Pitt? Other than obviously it being his hometown. Yeah, I believe Pitt offered late uh, when he was coming out of Aliquippa, which is really surprising. I mean, mm-hmm. it's right in their backyard. They've they've kind of had issues in the past uh, with some of their backyard talent, but he went to Kentucky trying to you know, get a foothold in that SEC. And, and you know, I, th- I believe he started a year there, uh, didn't have quite as much success as he was expecting. And then, uh, yeah, he, he went into the portal and Pitt was there and he saw the success that, that Narduzzi has had putting corners on an island in, in man coverage and letting them thrive. And that's really his game. I mean, he's not going to press you, but he's going to mirror with you. He's going to run with you. Um, he'll wall you off at times, but his his footwork is is outstanding. Um, you know, he's just always right there with the receiver and, and that was unlocked at Pitt because, you know, they, they play that man coverage. They're going to put their corners on an Island. They're going to blitz a lot and he thrived in it. Um, but yeah, he, I, I definitely, he didn't say this, but I, I definitely think he was regretting the whole SCC path initially, uh, just because he wasn't seeing the field, uh, as often as he expected and it helped coming home. You know, he could just be himself and, uh, he landed in a situation that was was fantastic for him, and it paid off the last two years. I think he had eight interceptions in two years, and three of them were pick sixes, which is a school record. So uh, great ball skills, and he he has a nose for the end zone. One of which was against West Virginia in yes, that backyard brawl, and obviously that's the play he's going to be remembered for in Pitt for, for a long, long time. Yeah, they run man, they run cover four under Pat Narduzzi, which puts more stress on the corners to, to match things vertically, not as much safety help, and so – um, you can kind of see the parallels, and he's long, he's thirty-three and a quarter yeah. on the length for being a five-eleven. I mean, he's not particularly heavy, one seventy-nine, but that length for that that frame is pretty interesting. Yeah, the only real concern I had with him was just you know how skinny his lower half was. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he, he's he's got a thin, wiry lower half, but yeah, he, he has great length. It showed throughout the week. Like I said, he's not going to be overly physical and really jam guys at the line of scrimmage. But when he has to get his hands on you, he can kind of redirect you. Uh, and he's able to make a ton of plays just being able to recover and run in the hip pocket. It's just, it showed up a lot throughout the week. And uh, once they got into team sessions, quarterbacks just were not testing him because they knew it, was, it, it just, it wasn't going to work out. And he shut down the complete side of a field throughout the week. One question I usually like to ask these guys, for these round tables. And I forgot to, I think that the, the shrine bowl and the senior bowl discussions was the small schoolers because those games, you know, the shrine bowl, the senior bowl, they're so important for the FCS level or even D2 mm-hmm. D3 guys to play up and go against that, you know, top FBS power five competition and get that more even playing field. It's really important for Pittsburgh. I remember Javon Hargrave, I think really became a stealer because how much he dominated in the senior bowl. And I think he was at the shrine bowl uh, prior to getting the call up. So that's really, really important for Pittsburgh. Were there any small school guys, you know, FCS and below players that, that stuck out to you? Uh, you know, the South Dakota state contingent that was there, Mason McCormick, uh, he's played guard. He's played center. Uh, he was, was terrific throughout the week. I think he really boosted his stock quite a bit. You know, it was a little disappointing to see Jalen Coker, the Holy Cross receiver. He went down with an injury, I believe, on day two. I think Joe Clark uh, had the report initially that he, you know, he'd met with the Steelers um, both at the Hula Bowl and um, here at the Shrine Bowl. And then he went down. But really, a lot of it was it wasn't like years past where there was those small schools guys where it was like, oh, OK, you're you're really burst on the scene. You're showing you belong here. Uh, the one guy, though, that that caught my attention was uh the Quantes uh Stiggers, the the CFL guy. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I saw he didn't get a combine invite, which was rather surprising, but I know he's not quote unquote small school, but just a really unique story. Uh and he he held his own throughout the week. I thought he had a really good day three uh, of practice and I thought he looked relatively good in the game. But yeah, this year not a ton of small school guys that really 
you know, blew up outside of McCormick. Gotcha. And then just kind of a last question, anybody else to mention any position that stuck out to you in a positive or negative fashion? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go to the edge rushers. I thought that the, uh, the Murphy brothers from UCLA were really impressive. They could not be blocked throughout the week whatsoever. It didn't matter who was put on them. Uh, they, they just, they dominated. There was one team session, um, where the, <laughs> the offense couldn't run a single play for like four or five straight reps because the Murphy brothers were, were blowing it up, uh, coming off the edge. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other guy, uh, you know, I, I was watching a lot of steel chambers, uh, at, at linebacker just cause one, I love the name and, and two, uh, you know, it, it always, you know, catches my eyes when, a, when a guy goes from running back to linebacker and has that type of athleticism. Uh, I, I thought he played physical throughout the week. Uh, but I was a little concerned about him in coverage, but that was the most interesting interview that I had down in, in Dallas uh, because he actually took over the interview at, at one point and was <laughs> asking me questions that made me think. So uh, just a very interesting guy. Part of me hopes he winds up being a stealer um, just to see how the media deals with him because I think he would really challenge them and, and be quite unique for, for us to watch. What was he asking you? He asked me what four animals I would take to war with <laughs> Just out of the blue, like he just started, he just jumped in and, and asked that. Yeah, he he said, "Can I ask a question?" And I went, "Oh, <laughs> oh boy, go ahead." And he, <laughs> he he hit me with it, and he had his answers. Mm. Um, I can't remember off the top of my oh, head what his I answers. Gonna, oh, I want to know his answers. Yeah, let, let me. Okay, so it was a um, it was a saber tooth tiger. Okay, it was a, a hippo, an elephant, and then there was one more that I'm not. Oh, a polar bear. Polar bear is okay. his favorite animal. Oh, and nice. he, he gave me reasons for it. And he said, what for would you be battling against me with? And it put me on the spot. And I just, I was dumbfounded. Like I was <laughs> expecting something random, but not that random. But uh, yeah, he just, he had a full explanation for every animal that he chose. And uh, just a, a really unique guy uh, reminded me quite honestly uh, uh, of Najee Harris, just out there, you know, marching to the beat of his own drum just a very unique guy, and, and and he was quite personable when when he was one on one. But yeah, I, I really hope that guy somehow winds up being a Steeler just for the type of content we could get throughout the year. <laughs> Put that in the scouting report for sure, because <laughs> uh, you, you did the report on on yes, Chambers yes. too, right? What was your yes, overall takeaway of just watching the tape, and not just the Senior Bowl or the Shrine uh, Bowl? Yeah, I liked the way he played the run. Um, I thought he was just a really smart player, able to kind of get through that traffic early on, find the football. Uh, he just, my issue was his ability and coverage. They never really asked him to play man all that much. And in zone, again, he he knows how to gain depth, but he never really had that feel for how to play zone. Uh, you know, teams kind of went right after him, throwing over him, throwing behind him uh, into the windows that he was kind of leaving there. But if you want a guy that can step in right away, you know, first two downs, run downs, I think he's your guy. He knows how to find those gaps. He's a former running back. He just has a nose for the football. And and I think that showed up this past season. He was a leading tackler uh, for Ohio State, even ahead of Tommy Eichenberg, who coming into the year was considered one of the best linebackers in college. So, um, yeah, I really liked his tape against the run. I like how he found the football. But there are some concerns uh, in, in coverage. So if you were mm-hmm. projecting him to the Steelers, he'd probably be more of that that buck, that downhill guy. Gotcha. No, really good information there. Let me ask you actually just one more question. Yeah. If if you don't have information, that's fine. I'm, I know I'm just we're putting you on the spot. We didn't have the the Dave and I patented two hour pre production <laughs> meeting that we always have, as you guys know. Uh, but I asked this question because there was uh, an interview that Justin Mello from the Draft Network did with Doug Nestor, the offensive guard, offensive tackle from West Virginia, and he mentioned he had a couple of really good meetings with Pittsburgh. Obviously they meet and talk with a bunch of guys. We're not putting too much stock into that, but you know, we talk about West Virginia offensive linemen. We're usually focusing so much on Zach Frazier, Nestor, a guy that hasn't been really talked about much. Did you get, did you or anybody else down there get any information on him in the week that he had? We didn't get a chance to talk to him. Uh, I know that during that session, I think we had four or five other linemen that we were speaking with. Um, but Really, he was he was right guard only at West Virginia. I think he had, uh, trying to recall off the top of my head here, more than 35, 40 starts at right guard. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, but the really cool thing was, is the the coaching staff challenged him throughout the week. He had snaps at center. He had snaps at both tackle positions. Mm. Uh, he just a very, very huge lineman. Uh, I think six, seven is what he checked in at. Uh, but yeah, in college, he was really only at, at right guard. But you can see, you know, the size and the strength. Uh, show up throughout the week and he he picked up the tackle positions rather quickly now I don't know if he was working at tackle during practice at West Virginia or whatnot but um you know I he, think he, he was stepped... right tackle his senior year I think he played some was right it? tackle okay. I, I okay. believe so the, the little I have on him okay I know I know that he was mostly right, right guard right. though but right. um uh yeah that was the thing where I can't recall what team he was on down there whether it was east or west but that team was challenging everyone to play out of position at times. And I mean, there were some snaps he had at left tackle that were pretty solid as well. So okay. uh, that that's really all the information, but I did see that from the draft network and it, it makes sense. I mean, he was a, a multi-year starter, a big guy, and uh, he showed some versatility throughout the week. Yeah. He's got a ton of experience. He's got some size. Um, I think he played hurt in 2023, he was saying, and he had a good Shrine Bowl weekend. So that's a guy I do want to watch. He's a later round guy, you know, yeah. day three, not going to go as high as Frazier, who could be a potential day one guy, but I think maybe more likely early day two, somewhere in round two for Pittsburgh. Um, but I did want to mention that because that was a story we wrote about here on on Thursday. And by the way, Josh and I are recording this here on Thursday night, posting this on Friday. So just if anything crazy happens from, you know, now until then, uh, we didn't cover it and, and that'd be the reason why. All right, um, going just kind of looking at your draft profiles, you've done a couple of them. You mentioned Green, Chambers. Have any other profiles you've done of maybe non-Shrine Bowl prospects you wanted to talk about and guys that might fit Pittsburgh? No, honestly, uh, you know, Edgerton Cooper was the first one I did. I kind of focused early on on, on some of the Shrine Bowl guys just because I saw them in person. Uh, you know, I worked through uh, Kentucky's Trevin Wallace here the last few days. That'll go up online on Friday. Uh, he was a guy that I was stunned when I saw Chad Reuter had him in his most recent three round mock in the first round uh, to the Steelers. Uh, you know, I, I watched five games of his. I don't quite see first round guy, but again, just a shade under six two. He checked in at I think two hundred forty four pounds at the Senior Bowl. Uh, he's got some decent athleticism, but he's just kind of that that big lumbering linebacker kind of struggles again in 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 coverage. Um, Plays the run well, but I, I just I can't get over the fact that that Reuter had him in the first round. It could be it could happen because of his size that he's one of the bigger linebackers in the class. Um, but I was expecting a little more going into his tape, and I think you'll you'll see some of that in my profile here on, on Friday. But uh, yeah, I, I really just focused on the the Shrine Bull guys, like I said, because uh, th- those are the guys I saw in person and yeah. wanted to knock those out. Gotcha. You no know, great coverage from you from the entire crew, Mel. Joe, Tony, I think you guys just crushed it and and gave us a ton of good uh, information to work with. So thank you guys for that. Uh, I want to transition now uh, to some of the coaching hires. And Dave and I have kind of covered all the hires by now. Arthur Smith, of course, the new OC. Tom Arth, the quarterback's coach. And Zach Azani, the new wide receivers coach. But you had done one of the write-ups on Azani, who the more that I've learned about him from reading your article a couple of days ago and some of the research that I've done, I would say whatever it's worth and probably not worth much, but I think he's my favorite hire of the couple they've made so far of Arthur, Arthur Smith and then Azani. And I think he's the right guy for what Pittsburgh needs, but kind of go into his background some and what's your thoughts on the hire of Zach Azani as a new wide receivers coach. Yeah, I'm right there with you. This is my favorite hire they've made so far. They needed a guy that would come in and, and not only demand respect, but have that accountability, you know, kind of things kind of went off the rails in the last few years. And that's not to, to put down Frisman Jackson. I think he had a, you know, kind of a tough task coming in with, with mm-hmm. some of these receivers, Deontay Johnson, George Pickens, um, and, and not having as much experience. But Azani comes to the table. He's been coaching receivers for 25 years, whether that's a, at the college level or at the NFL level. Uh, he's had a lot of success. And, and, and really, uh, I think your article the other day, highlighting some of his his quotes from his time in college that is exactly what the Steelers need in this receiver room you know Allen Robinson tried to be that veteran leader uh you know his I think his voice fell on deaf ears at times and I don't think that's going to happen with Azani when it comes to Johnson and Pickens this is a guy that 
He's going to be in your face. He's not going to care about your feelings. He's going to, you know, demand accountability, demand respect. He's going to want you to focus on the little things. And if you don't live up to that standard, it doesn't matter what your name is or how much money you make, you're not going to play under him. Uh, and I think in the past, we, we've we kind of seen the Steelers let that get away a bit, you know, let some of these guys get away with some stuff. And I don't, I don't think Azani's going to allow that. Uh, this right. is a guy that that played receiver himself in college. Uh, you know, he spent four years at, at Central Michigan, and then he went off and coached under some really good coaches uh, throughout his time in college. Spent a few years under Urban Meyer. Um, you know, it just this is a guy that he's had a track record of success, and uh, I think that is what this team needed. I think they tried it before with Ike Hilliard, and again, that that lasted two years. And it just it now, Alex, for me, it feels like this team has a guy in place that could be that long term answer. They haven't had that answer since, unfortunately, Daryl Drake passed away and they've kind of just been, you know, flipping through guys here. And I feel like Azani's going to put an end to that cycle. And, and I think it'll be for the best for the Steelers, because obviously they're going to invest in receivers again and again. That's just what this this team does. Uh, and to have that guy with his track record and his coaching style is going to be huge. I agree. I think he's going to be someone that's going to hold these guys accountable. They're going to butt heads. There's going to be some times where Deontay oh, yes. Johnson, George Pickens do not like Zach Azani, but I say good. And those things get worked out. And I, I think you had the comment from what Emmanuel Sanders. He talked yes. about butting heads with Azani, but over time, they you know came to really respect each other. And, and, and they just need some tough coaching guys that will set a high standard, keep that standard high, won't allow guys to round off routes, not show effort. Uh, you know, they, Guys, the guys have to be detail oriented consistently and do that every single practice, every single game. And I think once you kind of dive into his background, as you laid out, you really understand why he was the perfect hire. Yeah. And, I, you know, I think in the past two years, we've seen, you know, Pickens and Johnson have some of these sideline antics directed probably more towards Frisman Jackson and, and Jackson never really pushed back. I, I Again, this isn't an indictment on Jackson, but I don't think this is going to happen with Azani. I, I don't. You're going to see these guys butt heads for sure. We'll probably mm-hmm. hear about it even throughout the week during practices. Um, you know, Emmanuel Sanders had that quote that I had in my original article. Just the way Azani came in and was like, "This is how we're going to do things today. This is how we're going to do things throughout the week," and that rubbed that veteran the wrong way. That's going to happen in Pittsburgh, you know, and and Azani's going to have to set his foundation. But this is a guy again who. He's shown to be able to develop guys, get the best out of them, but also have that accountability. And and like I said, Pittsburgh hasn't had that, and it feels like they have that now. And there's been a a cultural shift a bit on the offensive side of the football because I think Arthur Smith is is kind of the same way. And mm-hmm. you know, I wrote this in my piece. I, I think Azani is a perfect fit under Arthur Smith. Just you know, reading your big book on Arthur Smith and what he wants at the receiver position and how Azani expects his receivers to play, it it meshes perfectly. And uh, hopefully we see it mesh well on the field here in 2024. It's going to be some tough love, I think, on that coaching side of the football, which, again, for the third youngest offense in in football, the Steelers were in 2023. They need that kind of stuff. And and I think Azani's been – I mean, it's not all just drill sergeant. I mean, you know, he cares about his guys from the comments and what he's talked about. So it's not just – ragging on these guys all the time but when there's a time you know to hold them accountable he's not going to ever kind of let stuff slide Mm -hmm. yeah and i think the thing that stood out to me i watched a a mic'd up segment from him uh at denver excuse me at denver broncos training camp in 2021 uh, i want to say and the energy that this guy brings alex i i cannot wait to read your reports from training camp here uh with the receiver group i mean he was tough on guys but he was also the first one down the field you know, they showed a clip of Deontay Spencer. There's a name to remember <laughs> uh, catching a touchdown pass in training camp. And Azani sprinted down the field to celebrate with, with Spencer. He did the same thing with Jerry Judy. Like this guy is going to obviously demand that respect, but he's also going to show love to his guys and, right. and bring that energy daily. And I, I think this is a great hire. I know people were like, that's the name they went for granted because a lot of people wanted Heinz Ward and, and understandable, <laughs> but uh <laughs> They needed a guy with with serious, uh, you know, a serious resume, serious experience, and and I really think they they hit a home run with Azani, and I cannot wait to to see him in training camp and hear your reports. Yeah, it can always be 
it is really tough to judge positional coaches that, you know, the deeper you go and the more removed from the field you get, the harder it is to, to judge somebody. But just from those clips and my own, you know, watching Prisma Jackson training camp, who I think seems to be a quality person. I think he's probably a fine mm-hmm. receivers coach, but Azani seems to be, as you said, more vocal, more energy. And that isn't always, you know, doesn't always translate into becoming a great coach, but I think it is different and something this unit needs. Yeah, and I think, you know, obviously Frisman Jackson, I think he would have been better with a veteran receiver room, not a, yeah. a position group with a, a Pickens, a Chase Claypool, a Deontay Johnson. And I think the Steelers finally realized that. Obviously, Chase Claypool's not here any longer, but they have young guys at the position that need to learn how to be pros, how to conduct themselves professionally. So you have to have that veteran coach. And I honestly, I think that they did a really good job targeting Gazzani and landing him. And taking advantage of a, a rather strange decision by the Jets to to move on from him after a year in which, you know, Garrett Wilson, I believe he garnered some all pro consideration. And then they, all of a sudden they, they changed receiver coaches. So, you know, the Steelers were fortunate to have a guy like Azani come available. And, and I think they did a really good job getting the type of coach they need for this current position group. You're right. It is a bit strange. Azani got dumped after one year. Um, I know the Jets receivers didn't have outstanding production, but given the horrible quarterback situation they were in, I think it's from my point of view, 30,000 foot view, it's hard to blame the receivers coach for that. They just you lose Aaron Rodgers four plays into the year and your whole plan and identity goes out the window. So did you get Do you do any research on why he was let go? What the, if there was any sort of pushback or surprise to that, was this kind of Robert Sala when you're kind of in that, are you going to stay? You're going to get fired, kind of just, just scapegoating and making changes to try to appease ownership. Do you have any idea why he was fired and if there was a, yeah. a surprise with that? Yeah, what I looked into was, you know, Solo was a bit disappointed in the receiver group outside of Garrett Wilson. You know, obviously they spent a lot of money on Alan Lazard and he was, quite frankly, not good. But again, yeah. out, outside of Garrett Wilson, what receiver was good in New York last year with with the quarterbacks that they dealt with? Uh, it It did feel a little bit like a scapegoat move, though. Um, you know, Garrett Wilson was pretty upset. I believe he took to Twitter and just thanked Azani for for the work that he did and how he helped make him a better receiver. Um, but it, it's not like they went in a, a strange direction. They they hired a former NFL receiver in, in Sean Jefferson, who has a, a, a long track record. But uh, it did feel like Sala kind of put a lot of the offensive struggles on the receivers uh, because of the money that they spent at the position. And unfortunately, Azani was was made out to be the scapegoat. and. Uh, yeah, the Steelers are fortunate that, that was the case, and, and I don't think him being let go by the Jets should be any indictment on him. Last question. This may this may be completely random. It probably is, but I, I cannot find the answer to this. With Azani, do you know what RAD means? R-A-D? He's used this acronym his entire coaching career, and I cannot figure out what RAD or R-A-D means. Do you happen to know by any chance? I cannot find it. He had it on a, 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 a cutoff sweater in training camp with the Jets and the Broncos. I cannot find it. I've asked Broncos reporters that oh, I'm really? friends with, and they are like, yeah, I got no clue. So I can't find it. Maybe that's something we – we hopefully someone in the Pittsburgh media listens to this and can ask him when he has availability <laughs> uh, because I want to know. I, you know, it's he has it everywhere. It's – yeah. You know, it was from the college level to the NFL level. He had it on his play sheet at one point in training camp. Oh, really? You could see it, yeah, at the top in that uh, that mic'd up segment with the Broncos. I, I I don't know, but whatever it is, he believes in it strongly. So I'd love to find out what it is. Yeah, me too. So if anybody happens to know Zach Azani, if you're listening to this, as I'm sure that you are, uh, let us know because I do. I, I it's yeah. probably just a, some I don't know standard acronym for. Some some philosophy there. It's probably nothing right. earth shattering, but I would like to know because I mean I've literally seen it over his entire bio, and I think he signed an autograph, a picture may be of one time, and it had rat on there. I just want to know what it means, just for my own curiosity. All right, uh, we'll switch gears now. To you have any thoughts on Tom Arthur? I don't know if you did any research on him. I I know you didn't write the article, but did you have any any particular thoughts on that? Uh, the only the only thought I really had was I thought it was a bit unfair of people to kind of blame him for maybe some of the quote unquote regression that Justin Herbert had in, in 2023. Um, I, I don't think that that was Tom Arth's doing. I mean, the first year Tom Arth worked with Justin Herbert, Justin Herbert finished top 10 in MVP votes and, and, and cut down on turnovers sacks. He had an increase in completion percentage. 
Uh, just a smart guy. I think you wrote, isn't he one of the greatest players in John Carroll University history? Um, so I, he just seems like a really smart guy. Um, mm-hmm. his, has some some solid experience, and I thought he got some of the best play out of Herbert as that that quarterback coach slash passing game coordinator. Um, but yeah, last year with the Chargers, everything was a mess. So kind of taking anything there from Arth is is, is pointless for me. Sure. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm excited that they they have a, a younger quarterback coach that has experience working with a high end quarterback. Uh, again, that's not a knock on on Mike Sullivan, but uh, yeah, I was expecting Arth to be the passing game coordinator, and now he's the quarterback coach. So uh, I'm excited to see what he can bring to the table. And now we'll see what role and title Mike Sullivan has still listed as quarterback coach alongside Arth on the team site. So I guess they're still figuring those things out. I mean, I don't know if it's going to be, will Sullivan have a pass game title, which does not typically happen in Pittsburgh? Will he be assistant head coach? Will it be, could it be assistant quarterbacks coach, I suppose, because David Corley's gone. Um, I don't know. So we'll stay tuned. What do you think he'll get? What I, I would imagine it would be assistant head coach. That that would be the only mm-hmm. logical thing. But but what are you, kind of, how are you feeling about the whole Sullivan situation? Yeah, I mean, that would make sense. It's been available since John Mitchell retired, um, and Mitchell was working in a also part of a liaison-type role, which I don't know Sullivan would, would have because Mitchell was doing stuff with kind of alumni and transitioning mm-hmm. players from either the post-playing days. I, it could be something like that. I, I'd be more curious on the actual role because title can be whatever, but what are you actually doing? What is your role? Right. How are you working with the offense? What part of the game are you, are you game planning? What's your role on game day? You know, will he have some sort of, you know, upstairs booth role as an overseer? Could there be a potential to help clock management or something? I mean, he's never been a head coach, but he's been an OC. He's a a veteran of the game. Could he kind of be a a set of eyes and ears for Tomlin in that regard? I really don't know. I'm kind of surprised he's still here. You hire Tom Arth and, you know, you you freeze Sullivan out of the OC interview process. Don't even consider him from the get-go. If I was Mike Sullivan, I'd be looking for another job personally, but like maybe he's under contract and didn't have any other place to go. And not only that, I mean, that's a guy that obviously you, you want to bring back Mason Rudolph. You have Kenny Pickett still on the roster. Those two guys have spoken glowingly about Sullivan. Is there some sort of conflict with a guy like Sullivan in the room with Arth? You know, wouldn't you just want to avoid that? So I, I'm very curious to see. Uh, what his role will be, especially if it's not going to be as quarterback coach, uh, what they're going to do with him. One article you wrote recently, Josh, I think you got some pushback for it about the punter situation with Presley Harvin being released on Monday. No punter currently on the roster. You know, how do you, what path do you take to acquire that next punter? I think you talked about go draft somebody and got some pushback for that. So kind of make your case of why you're still in favor of drafting a punter, even though the Harvin pick did not work out. Yeah, certainly got some pushback. I had, uh, you know, the guy I have circled is Tory Taylor from Iowa. I, I think obviously that guy has a great track record at the collegiate level. Some people are concerned with the age; he'll be twenty six, but you can punt him into your forties. It's right. not like it, you, you know. It's he's twenty six. I didn't he's know. Twenty, that. yeah, he's twenty six. So uh, he, he's on the older side, um, but I mean, some of his his punts at Iowa are incredible. He has mm-hmm. an incredible tape uh, with the Hawkeyes. I think he punted almost a hundred times last season. Which is an indictment on their def- or on their offense overall. But yeah, I just you know they 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 went the the Harvin route, and people want to say, oh, he was the best punter in college that year. He was the only punter drafted. That's more of an indictment on that actual punting class uh, than it would be saying much about Harvin. I think you wrote in your report there were concerns about you know consistency issues in college, and I think we saw that uh, at the NFL level in in three years. I, I just want this team to understand that the punting position is is so important especially with the style of play that they want to lean into which is running the football you know controlling the game in that standpoint leaning on their defense overall and to help that defense you want to be able to pin opposing offenses deep uh i know that they obviously deploy a, a directional punting style but i want to see them invest highly in a punter you know people were saying they did that with Harvin. Well, that was a seventh round pick. Then people brought up Daniel Sepulveda, which that was mm. a, a flashback name. Um, you know, I, I just think you look at the last few years, and I had this in my article, some of the top punters in the league have been drafted in that fourth, fifth, sixth round range. There were even some guys drafted in the third round. Um, you know, and I know that this team has some holes and 
the thought of spending a fourth round pick on a punter seems absolutely wild. You know, it, it still does to me, but I think Taylor's that kind of that game changing weapon in the punting game. And if you can get him or a, a guy like Ryan Reckow from BYU, I know Joe Clark talked to him at the Shrine Bowl and just the way that guy was booming punts throughout the week was really impressive. Uh, so I, I don't want to see this team, you know, no pun intended punt on the punting position again and, and just kind of find that that bargain bin guy. If you're not going to go, you know, heavy in the draft at the position, I'd like to see them spend some money in free agency for one of these proven top guys. Uh, but I think that the better option is to do it in the draft with one of those two fourth round picks. And, you know, I, I think come the season, if they're leaning on a guy like Tory Taylor, that people aren't going to care where he was drafted if he's doing mm-hmm. his job at a high level like he did in college. So that's that's where I'm at. I mean, you, you look at how the league is shifting. I mean, look at the Ravens. They spent a fourth round pick on Jordan Stout, and he's given them two great years, uh, and he's right. been a weapon for them. Jake Camardo was picked right after him uh, in 2022, and he's been great for Tampa. So you're seeing smart teams invest in the punting position. And that's what I want to see the Steelers do because it's, it's been an issue for them for, for quite a while. And even in the Super Bowl, the punters were the all-stars at one point, Tom yes. Townsend for the chiefs and Mitch Wisnowski for the 49ers. So I, it, it is critical for the way Pittsburgh's built where you want to flip the field and your offense, hopefully it'll be better. It needs to be better, but it's still not going to be potent or, you know, put up 30 points per game. So you need that, that weapon. It's a starter. What was the stat that you had seven of the 10 top punters yes. in average were, were draft picks or something like that? Yeah, seven of the 10 um, out of net uh, punting yards per per punt uh, this past season were draft picks. Um, okay. So I got a lot of people that say, you know, oh, you can go on the waiver wire or you can sign an undrafted free agent or what may be. And it's like, well, the league is investing more and more in the kicking game whether it's punting or, or, or kicking. And, and I think that obviously the Steelers tried that with Harvin. It uh, didn't work out, but that shouldn't cause them to to think twice about doing it again. You know, each each situation is is different, and uh, I think this is a very very good punting class, especially with Taylor at the top. And you're going to have to spend a premium pick to get that guy. And uh, I would be good with it with one of those two uh, fourth round picks. And I think that that makes the most sense for me. And you know, like I said, I got a lot of pushback on Twitter from it and in the article and. Uh, I still stand by it, and I think it will not matter where they get that punter uh, if they spend that fourth-round pick, and and he plays very well in 2024 and beyond. Sure, I'm not opposed to it, but you better get it right. I mean, that's one where you just can't, you know, if you miss on a fourth-round different position, that's one thing, but a punter with how kind of visible it is, you got to get that one, you know, 100% right. Yeah, you cannot be the New England Patriots of 2021 and whiff on Jake Bailey in the fourth round and then have to draft a punter two years later. So, yeah got to get it right um but i think even Reckow that you mentioned from byu i know taylor is kind of the talk as a top punter but his mm-hmm. career was he's one of the best punters in college football history i think right behind ryan stonehouse he's one of the best punters in the nfl today with tennessee so that's a name that i want to learn more about and do a profile on at some point yeah he, he's he's quite the story um so yeah i, I just i really think it's a, a very good punting class and i want to see the steelers get involved in it Uh, This isn't the same class, you know, type of class that Harvin was in, where, again, he was the only punter drafted. We could see three, four punters get drafted in Mm -hmm. this class. Yeah, at least two, I think, and potentially more than that. Last thing to talk about, Josh, Kevin Colbert was on uh, a North Catholic uh, high school (laughs) athletics podcast, which is uh, where he's from, a North Catholic kid. And so it was a, a cool opportunity for uh, the people, I think students, they were to, to talk with Kevin Colbert, and they probably didn't expect it to become one of the one of the biggest stories in Pittsburgh. I think, yeah, you know, really, on, on uh, Wednesday, and one of the most, I think, controversial <laughs> comments that Colbert made that certainly the internet found and ran with after he wrote about it was Colbert's take on analytics. He was asked, you know, are analytics overused? And Colbert said, you know, essentially, yes, they are overused by the NFL. And he's somebody that focuses on hearts and smarts and tangibles, all things he espoused and talked about repeatedly in Pittsburgh. And so um, the analytics crowd found that on Twitter and and ran with that and had a lot of pushback (laughs) there. What were your thoughts on Colbert's comments? I mean, I wasn't surprised by them. I I think his, his track record late in his career showed his thoughts on analytics. I mean, the Steelers had one of the smallest analytics staffs in the league. Um, so I, I wasn't surprised by it. You know, I know that when we put that article out there, it, it blew up and rightfully so, but 
I, that's a guy that's been around football since the late nineties. Of course, he's going to have that thought process of, you know, analytics can't measure intangibles like that. That wasn't surprising to me, but it was him saying the quiet part out loud where it was mm-hmm. like, Oh, Kevin, like <laughs> you, you don't have to, to, you know, do this, but, uh, no, I wasn't surprised, Alex. I mean, like I said, some of his moves late in his career showed that. And I mean, even in game, let's be honest, Mike Tomlin isn't really a, an analytics guy. He's more of a, a gut feel guy. So yeah, wasn't all that surprising. And uh, it also wasn't surprising to see the internet take it and run with it. <laughs> yeah. In fairness to Colbert, he didn't completely dismiss analytics. Right. Here's, here's uh, part of the quote after he said they, he believes they are overused. He said, quote, at the end of my career with the Steelers, obviously it came into play, and I used to encourage our younger scouts and say, keep me up to date, tell me what I'm missing. We had analytics people, and I used to challenge them. I said, when you guys can measure the intangibles, let me know, because that's the most important thing, end quote. Um, and so he saw the usefulness of them, and I could tell. I mean, the team certainly, I, I'm sure, had the information. It's really right. about how, how much you value the information and how you infuse the information into the process. and. Analytics should not be a substitute for tape and watching, you know, film on guys and watching guys in person, getting to know them, the background. That is all I think very, very important, and which was near and dear to Colbert. Um there's just there's just a line and a balance that you have to to work overall. And I, I think Colbert still didn't necessarily value them enough. Yeah. And I my pushback on that would have been if I were the interviewer of okay, Kevin, what are analytics to you? You know, yeah. Define the analytics that that you're concerned with, because, you know, I saw some people say, well, of course, he's not into analytics. That's why he traded up for an inside linebacker or drafted a running back in the first round. It's like, are those analytics like is that positional analytics? Like what analytics are we talking about here? Is it the decision to go for it in certain situations or positional value in general or, you know, height, weight, speed, stuff like that. I would have liked to know what he defines as analytics because he talked about you can't measure those intangible things, the the hearts and smarts. So I would have liked a little bit more explanation from him there as to to what he truly views analytics as. But, uh, you know, that's that's all we got from him. And, and like I said, I wasn't surprised. Yeah, I mean, I think the comment of him challenging analytics people and saying when you guys can measure the intangibles let me know i mean of course they can't measure that concretely that's i think just a a fruitless thing to to tell somebody i think it kind of misses the point of what analytics can be and can't be and and the usefulness but again i know that they use them i mean heck when they missed on jarvis jones all they (laughs) did in the first round after that was draft a bunch of athletes like all their guys had really high relative athletic scores and I don't know for sure if that's what they were using, but there was a common theme between they wanted athletes. I'm pretty sure after they missed on Jarvis Jones, they kind of took a look and said, you know, because Colbert had the the quip when Jones ran like a four nine at the combine. He's like, I'm yeah. happy he ran four nine because he fell in the draft to us and <laughs> regretted, I'm sure, him running that. So he probably <laughs> wishes he would have ran a four five, wouldn't have gotten to Pittsburgh and wouldn't have missed on him. So they they made the adjustment from there and, and maybe some ways even overcorrected and focused too much on the athleticism. But you can certainly kind of feel they had types of guys and they certainly had their benchmarks as well. Um, so I, I do want to give them some credit because I don't think they were completely anti-analytics, but they I'm sure valued them less than most teams, and that was evident because they kept losing all their analytics people. They would just go somewhere else. Kareem Kaysen right. left for Duolingo, the Spanish, you know, or the language learning software. And Jay Whitmire left for the Jets. And Will Britt recently left for Dallas. And so when you have guys that just jump ship for other teams, other opportunities, that kind of tells you how their work is being valued or not being valued. Yeah, and the one thing I would push back on with some of the criticism of Colbert, too, is like, okay, you want the Steelers to be – more into analytics than they have been. But at the same time, some of these people that were pushing back on Colbert's comments were also crushing a guy like Dan Campbell, who was aggressive and leaned heavily into analytics with his decision-making. It's like, what do you want? What, where, where is that middle ground that would appease people? Um, because I, I honestly, I think if Mike Tomlin were to ad- adapt that, that Dan Campbell style, I think people would lose their minds. So it's like, mm-hmm. what, where is the middle ground with analytics in football today. That that's something I struggle with, you know, it a little off topic here. You look at baseball, that's all you talk about is the analytics at this point. It has taken over the game and I think yeah. it's getting that way with football, but 
where is that middle ground of, okay, these numbers matter. These numbers aren't as important. This is what you need in a player evaluation. This is what you can kind of use as an argument. Like, I, I just want to know where that middle ground is. And I don't think we're at that point yet. I'm not sure if we ever will. Cause I don't know if yeah. you can, you know, neatly draw that line. It's going to vary team to team. I mean, analytics will grow and become more important and more prevalent in, in all aspects of football evaluation, draft, in-game, otherwise. I mean, heck, at practice, you have guys on these you know, tracking devices of how many steps they have, right. what their mileage is, and all those kinds of things. And that's all well and good. And I think Pittsburgh's used that. I'm sure like the rest of the NFL and gotten a bunch of useful information of that. Um, my concern just Pittsburgh to have too small of an analytics group and not even having enough information or not enough uh, valuing that information to compete in a world that's you know, trending that way. Yeah. And, and do you feel that they're trending in the right direction when it comes to that? Or is it still going to be that, that long, slow slog in a sense for the, for the Steelers organization? It's hard to tell. I mean, you can assume once Omar Khan, Andy White will, mm-hmm. you know, come in and, or be elevated in Khan's case, they're going to, value that more as kind of younger, more new age type of people. I haven't seen from a staffing standpoint, much of a change. They still have two people with an analytic title uh, right now and Tosin Kazim, who does some scouting as well. And then they hired Donovan Brooks last September to replace Will Britt who left for Dallas. Mm -hmm. Um, But to me, even again, it's, it's not always about, because you could hire 10 people to work analytics and present present information. If you don't utilize that information, it doesn't really matter how many people you have working on that into the question of, you know, how much do they use it? I really couldn't tell you for sure. Especially. Yeah. I know that Patrick Peterson said during the season that Mike Tomlin doesn't rely on analytics, you know, leaning up into, to game planning or advanced scouting. So it's how much information are they getting and how much are they using it is, is the question. Yeah. There's a difference between having it and and using it and utilizing it and utilizing it the right way. And that balance, which we can talk about for hours and probably never come to a real, you know, concrete conclusion on, but that was the comment. I think, you know, I'm not going to be somebody that bashes Kevin Colbert. I think you like to take some glee and trashing him and kind of forget how quality of a GM that he was, but it is fair to say, I think Pittsburgh was putting themselves at some sort of disadvantage by the end. And I think even at the end, Kober did some good things. I, I think my biggest critique of him was 2022. A, I don't think he should have been the GM for that final year. I think he should have yeah. stepped down after the, I guess it would have been the 2021 season after Ben retired instead of going through the entire offseason process. Then they hire a GM, Colbert officially steps down and you kind of just, you know, you, you lost it off season for the new guy for Con and, and for Andy Wyatt. And plus, I think the decisions in 2022 were not great in terms of mm-hmm. the core for deal. The Ogan Joby contracts not looking too strong. Of course, Kenny Pickett, if that doesn't work out, then that'll be a mark on Colbert's uh, resume negatively. So that's really my my biggest critique. And no one ever talks about that, but he should have not gone through 2022 that off season. He should have been stepping down then. They go through the GM search like any other team. That might have fired their GM, hired somebody then, and let him go through that process. You look at a Baltimore when Ozzie Newsom stepped down. That was right after a season ended, and then Eric DaCosta mm-hmm. took over for that that off season. Um, that happened in Green Bay when Ted Thompson stepped down. I think it was Brian Guntakus that came in. That was right after the season. You rarely see GMs that will go through the bulk of the off season post draft and then they make a change. Only time this ever happened, it's like somebody got fired. I think. The Jets with Mike McCagnan a couple of years yes, back. When, and yeah, they, they hired Joe signed. Douglas. Yeah, they yeah. hired Joe Douglas. Yep. Which was yeah, a disaster this, in a million ways. Right. And this isn't you having recency bias or anything like that, like or you know, the the opportunity of hindsight. You were saying this yes. at the time too. Like yes. this was this was a very puzzling decision from the franchise for your perspective when it happened immediately. It was like, why is Kevin Colbert in charge of the offseason? Why is he in charge of the draft? Like just Make the move now, and and yeah, I mean that off season was 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 pretty tough for the Steelers. It's not looking great, especially you know the draft with with Pickett and that decision. Um, you know, obviously Mike Tomlin had a hand in that as well. And in sure from all you know aspects, it it seems like Omar Khan was one hundred percent on board with with Pickett. But uh, it would have just been better if they could have made that move to the next GM as soon as the season ended. And let them have that full offseason. Because right now it feels like Khan and, and Weidel are kind of playing catch up to try mm-hmm. and 
make up for some of these mistakes. And that's, I think that's what Ray Fittipaldo said earlier in the week that I wrote the article about the Steelers are in a, a bad cycle right now with draft misses and having to spend some money in free agency and kind of getting away from that build through the draft, develop our own guys situation. And it's been a tough task for, for Connor and Weidel, but uh, they had a good off season this past year. Yeah. Yeah. There's some debate about, I think what Fittipaldo said probably for yeah. a different time, but um, yeah. And, and again, it's not even, you know, it could have been a good off season for COVID. I still would have had the same yeah. right, I guess in principle, just because I think it's just bad process. Um, but I think you've had the results, obviously on top of that, the results don't look too good. And and that's, that's, that's a criticism, criticism of COVID that I would levy heavier and more so than, than the analytics part of it. Um, but no one really ever talks about that aspect anymore. 100%. Yeah. hundred percent agree with you. All right, Josh, any final thoughts? You want anything else you wanted to talk about that we did not get to? No, that's that's really it. I know that, uh, yeah, Monday they kind of made all the moves all at once, which yeah. was uh, rather surprising. Um, but uh, hopefully, uh, not hopefully, I think things are going to be a little quiet here for the next few weeks. Um, and we'll see what happens with, you know, obviously Mason Rudolph ahead of free agency and all that. And um yeah, I think as I sit here now, Alex, I think Rudolph signs elsewhere, and oh, really? we're gonna have we're gonna have Ryan Tannehill and Kenny Pickett and some draft pick. <laughs> that's yeah. just uh, just gut feel right now. Yeah, for as much talk as there is about Justin Fields and some more Kirk Cousins media chatter, um, yeah. I think it's far more likely either Rudolph resigns or they sign a veteran equivalent like a Tannehill or somebody else like that. Those are probably the two most likely names right now in Rudolph and Tannehill. I think they're uh, it's far more plausible that's the direction Pittsburgh goes than trading for Justin Fields. Yeah, it's fun to talk about Justin Fields. Obviously, there's that clip from the Ohio State Pro Day in 21 with Tomlin saying, you know why we're here, you know, put on a show. But there's too many variables that, that you know, have to be tackled with the whole field situation. And I don't think the Steelers would justify picking up a twenty, almost $22 million fifth year option without seeing him play a snap for them. So. Yeah, right, it's, which just, is what, it's just media chatter. It's just what Dave Bryan has talked about. Yep. about if you if yep. you trade for him, you ha- almost have to pick up the option. You're tied to him for the next two years. Pittsburgh's not looking for that. They won competition. They're not closing the book on Kenny Pickett. You trade for Justin Fields. That book is closed on Pickett. That is yep. not the, the path Pittsburgh's headed in right now. Right or wrong, that's not where they want to go. Yeah, and I think Dave Wanstead said something recently uh, very similar on NBC Sports Chicago. Like, the Steelers still believe in Pickett. So, you know... They yes, they say things to the media that might not always be true, but it is not the Steelers' mode of operation to give up on a first round draft pick after two years. Um, I, you have to believe Tomlin and Rooney, you know, at their word what they said this off season, and they still believe in Pickett, and they're not going to go out and sign a Kirk Cousins or a, a Russell Wilson or trade for a Justin Fields because that closes the book on Kenny Pickett, right or wrong, and right. and. That would be that, and that's just not the way the Steelers do do business. So, your best bet is is Rudolph Tannehill, maybe a Jacoby Brissett, a draft pick. I mean, I would say it's your best bet. You can debate if it's the right strategy, but I just think it, that's what's going to happen. That's the yeah. the path of Pittsburgh, the reality of the situation. And we can talk about Fields. You can say it's the right move. I mean, I'm not going to be enthralled by a Kenny Pickett Tannehill quarterback battle. No. I don't know if that's going to go get where Pittsburgh wants to go, but I. I just think the media is talking about it a lot more than Pittsburgh's actually entertaining the idea. Yeah. And I I thought, you know, you brought up a great point, something that I didn't have in the initial article, but made sure to add Mark Sadowski was the director of college uh, scouting for the bears when fields was picked. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there was that report from Brad Spielberger from PFF that members of the front office are big Justin Fields fans. Well, there's probably one of them, but yeah. Again, that doesn't mean that they're going to go out and get them. Um, you know, if that fifth-year option wasn't hanging out there, if, if you know this was maybe last year or whatever it may be, maybe it's more plausible. But mm-hmm. yeah, Dave's covered it a ton. I just I can't see it, and it just feels like we are going to get beat over the head for the next four weeks with Justin Fields and Steelers talk. Yeah, we already have it. it oh, yeah, felt yeah. Like I'm kind of yes. already tired of the story, but I know we'll have to, to keep discussing it. I mean, Sadowski may love Fields, and he probably did like him coming out, considering the role that he was in when Chicago drafted him. Um, and Sadowski is close with Omar Khan. They go way back to Tulane, and he was one of the first ha- hires that Khan made whenever he became GM in that would have been, what was that, May of 2022. But Sadowski's not the decision maker. It's Omar right. Khan. It's Mike Tomlin. It's Art Rooney. And so what they say, what they think is what matters. 
Correct. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's 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 a story that's not going away anytime soon. I don't think the Kirk Cousins story is going away anytime soon either, especially after the report that came out the other day that what was it Florio said that the Cousins camp is monitoring Pittsburgh and Atlanta. Uh, that's not going anywhere. But, uh, yeah, I think your your best bet of what happens is Rudolph Tannehill insert veteran free agent here yep. uh, on an affordable deal and, and probably a day three draft pick. I'm with you, Josh. So any other final thoughts or anything else to wrap up with? No, that's it. And I just, I appreciate you having me on. And like I said at the top, I hope Dave's enjoying his vacation and uh, yeah, we're rolling along here in the off season. Yeah, for sure. So we'll be back. I I think for Monday, I'll definitely have a Monday live stream. Uh, YouTube live stream will just be, I think me um, an hour over there and then it'll get posted to the site. I'm not entirely sure what we'll do for the podcast. It may have Josh back on, may have somebody else, may have a couple of people on. Uh, I do want to get our Tom Mead on at some point this draft season to get some of his thoughts as well. But Josh, thank you again for filling in uh, for Friday, at least. Absolutely, man. I really appreciate you having me on. All right. Time for my world famous outros. I keep forgetting to do (laughs) until I jump on the mic here and I go, I got to do the outro today. So I may, I may mess this up entirely, but we're going to roll with it. And please uh, judge, please judge kindly here for however I I end this thing. So you can follow Josh Carney on Twitter at, as I got to pull up his name because I forgot to have it pulled up here at by Josh Carney. You can follow myself on Twitter at Alex underscore Kazora. Sure to follow Dave on Twitter at Steels Depot. You want to comment and to the site, you can send us an email at uh, the terrible podcast at uh, gmail.com. Thank you guys so much for listening and we'll talk to you soon.